All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this, this presentation on iNaturalist and the City Nature Challenge. And one thing that I think is so cool is that this is coinciding with Earth Day. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but I think being a community scientist is a great way to celebrate Earth Day. So please add this to your Earth Day celebration plans. Just have a reminder up here that if you haven't downloaded the iNaturalist app and set up a free account, you don't have to have that for this presentation. But if you're the type of person that learns best by doing, you may want to have that open and ready to go just so that you can follow along as we go through some of the app's features. Okay. And with that, I think we're going to get started. <laughs> okay, so this presentation is going to give you everything you need to become a community scientist right in your own backyard. And you're going to learn all of this in time to participate in the City Nature Challenge, which is a community science project that's coming up at the end of April. Now, I've got this presentation down in two parts. Um, I'll come back to this. Uh, actually, let's do this now. Okay, so quiz time. Uh, what is iNaturalist? Is it A, an in the field species identification tool? B, a social media network for naturalists, scientists, and educators? C, a scientific database? D, a personal field journal and species checklist? Or E, all of the above? And if you wanna answer, you can put it in the chat. All right, I got one person that said E right away. Okay, anybody else want to agree, disagree? Guessing E, okay. <laughs> a lot of times when it's these uh, all of the above questions, that's kind of a hint, right? Okay, you guys got it, it is E. So this is just a quick introduction to some of the things that iNaturalist can do. It can do all of these things. Doesn't mean you need to use all of these features, but it's nice to know that they're available. Okay, here's what I started to say. This presentation is gonna be in two parts. And the first part is really gonna be an introduction to the app itself. And it'll go over all the technical details on how to use the app, as well as how to participate in that community science project I mentioned, the City Nature Challenge. I kind of think of part one as being level one, and then part two as being level two, because in part two or level two, we're gonna get into some more uh, advanced techniques for field sampling. And I'm gonna show you some really cool things you can set up in your backyard that'll help you find really cool plants and animals. So um, stick around to the end because that's my favorite part. Okay, and we're in part one right now. So we're gonna be talking about the app and the City Nature Challenge. And uh, I have the chat open. So if you have a question at any time, feel free to put it in the chat. If you wanna unmute yourself and interrupt, feel free to do that too. This is a really casual presentation, so um, you don't have to like wait to the end or anything like that to ask your question. Go ahead and interrupt. That's what I prefer, so um, feel free to do that. Okay, so what is the City Nature Challenge? Have you heard about this event before? Basically, it is a census of the plants and animals that we have in our urban landscape. Census is sometimes called a bio blitz when we're talking about nature. So a census or a bio blitz is just counting the plants and animals and identifying them. And this challenge in particular focuses on urban landscapes. These are areas that tend to be a little underappreciated when it comes to nature. We think of nature as being a far away place that's you know, remote and untouched, but there's actually so much nature that we can appreciate right here in the DC area. And this community science project helps us learn a little bit more about the plants and animals of our local landscape so that we can then better protect them and also learn from them. So how do we um, compete with this City Nature Challenge? It is a competition and it's a competition between, it's an international competition between cities all over the world. So there's actually over 300 cities around the world that are competing this year. And the DC area is one of those competitive cities. And when we're competing, we're competing on three aspects. So we're trying to have the most participants, which is just the most people that participate at all, whether they do one observation or a hundred observations. If you're a participant, then you're helping us with this part. 
Then the next competitive aspect is which city will record the most observations. So every time you submit something that you find to iNaturalist, it counts as an observation. And then the last category is which city will find the greatest amount of biodiversity? Which city will have the most species of plants and animals? So we're included in the DC region and that actually is a pretty large area. You can see here on my map that the entire area outlined in green is considered the DC region. So it includes downtown. It also includes several counties in Maryland and Northern Virginia and even West Virginia. And the cool thing is, if you're standing in one of these counties and you use iNaturalist during the challenge weekend, it automatically counts towards the city nature challenge. So you don't have to go somewhere specific like a park. As long as you're within one of these counties, it counts. So here's how I like to use iNaturalist. I go out into the field, I take my smartphone with me, and I look for a cool plant or animal like this little toady here. And this is the part where if you wanted to follow along with your own, uh, your own smartphone, you can open the app now, and it'll, uh, I'll go through step by step how to use it. So um, if you want to follow along, you can do that now. Okay, so how to use iNaturalist step one. When you open iNaturalist, it's gonna bring you to this dashboard. If you've already made some observations, then you're gonna see them here, sort of like a Facebook feed. Um, so you can see I've, I've made some observations recently and they're, and they're listed in my dashboard. There won't be anything here though if you're making your very first observation. I'm using an iPhone system. And if you're on Android, you'll have all the same features, but it'll just look a little bit different. The first thing I'm going to choose is the observe button. On an iPhone, it's going to be the camera in the center of the screen. On an Android, it's going to be a plus sign. But either way, you choose the observe button. And then it's going to bring up these options. So you have a couple ways to make an observation. You can, if you choose the camera button, it's going to open your phone's camera. You can take pictures right through the app live in real time of that plant or animal that you're looking at. My favorite way to use uh, the app though is to actually pull photos from my camera roll. So I, I personally like to go out into the field, take pictures just using my phone's regular camera app. And then later I'll go to iNaturalist and upload them through my camera roll. And now for the first time, you can also record sounds. This is a brand new feature added this year. So you can actually open um, the microphone button and it'll record sounds like bird calls or frog calls and you can actually make an observation that way. I'm gonna pull from my uh, camera roll here and just choose one of the photos that I took before. And I've got this photo here of this beautiful wildflower that's blooming right now. It's a nice red color. It kind of looks like a shooting star. I would like to figure out what this is. So I've chosen that photo and now you can see that it's in the uh, top row. And the next thing I'm gonna do is choose this button. What did you see? So this is where iNaturalist prompts you to try to figure out the species, what plant or animal you're looking at. And this is where the magic happens because when you click that, it's gonna make some suggestions. And this is iNaturalist using artificial intelligence to scan your photo. And then it's gonna actually try to tell you what it is. And you'll notice that at the very top, it says, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Ocalegia. And then the next suggestion is an actual species. So um, the, the Ocalegia is a group of plants. And then the Ocalegia canadensis is one specific species of plant. And in this case, iNaturalist got it absolutely 100% correct because this is a red columbine, also known as Ocalegia canadensis. So I'm gonna choose that. Um, I have uh, here just a note that if you're not sure what you're looking at, then I usually just choose that first uh, choice where it says, I'm, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Ocalegia. I would just choose that if you have no idea what it is, uh, just to be on the safe side. But I happen to know that this is a red columbine, so that's what I'm gonna put in my observation next. If you really have no idea what something is, you can classify things uh, even more generally. You could just call it plant if you really had no idea what it is. So uh, don't get nervous about that. 
All right, so I've added this identification now. I'm ca calling this red column by. The very last step is just to check that all of the information that's here below is correct. And if you have location uh, sharing enabled as on your settings with iNaturalist, this information should automatically populate. So when I took the photo, it's gonna automatically fill in the date and the place. So on your first observation, you should just check that this is this is happening because if it's not, you might need to change one of your settings and allow for your location to be shared. But basically it's gonna pull that information automatically for you. And I actually did take this picture uh, last year in April during the City Nature Challenge. And it was at Black Hill Regional Park in Clarksburg, Maryland. So this is all correct. So the very last thing is to hit the share button. And then your observation is uploaded to the scientific database. Now, I love how easy it is to use the app right from my phone, but if you would prefer to do things uh, with a real camera and go out there during the City Nature Challenge, take nice pictures with your nice camera, you can also go to this place, this is inaturalist.org, and you can upload your pictures through the website. So you can connect your camera to your computer, take your photos off your camera, put them on your computer, and then go to inaturalist.org and upload them that way. So uh, you can also do it from a computer as well. Okay, so this is how I like to use iNaturalist, but um, I'm just one person. And if we're gonna make this a uh, community science project, well, we need a community, right? So that's where you guys come in. And when hundreds and thousands of us team up and do this all over the DC region, at the same moment in time, we're creating a snapshot of this moment in time in our local landscape that scientists can study. And here's some of the things that they do with that information. So I can speak directly as uh, uh, someone in Montgomery Parks, uh, what we, how we use this information. And we use this information a couple different ways. So uh, we take information out of iNaturalist and it helps us track the spread of invasive species. So when we have a brand new invasive weed come up, it might show up in a brand new park and we had no idea that it was even there. Someone snaps a picture of it, puts it in iNaturalist, now we can get on that and try to get it out of that park before it takes over. So we're using iNaturalist to track invasive species. We're also using it to monitor the recovery of rare or threatened species, so kind of the opposite. Uh, there are places where we thought there were wildflowers that were no longer growing in, in, in these certain parks, and um, we're starting to see some of those wildflowers come back, and uh, they're popping up in places that uh, they haven't been for a very long time. So we're using information in iNaturalist to find where these wildflowers are, are coming back as well. And we hope to, we're not doing this yet, but we hope to then also use information from iNaturalist to help us see how the landscape is changing over time, especially with things like climate change. Are we seeing a different selection of species coming in? Are we seeing things bloom earlier than they used to? Are things migrating sooner than they used to? So we're not quite using this iNaturalist for this purpose yet, but we hope to, especially if we do things like the City Nature Challenge every single year, that snapshot of that moment in time, we can compare those year after year. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that this is a good thing for you to become involved with because it does help uh, not only organizations like mine, but many organizations across the DC region uh, get a good picture of their local landscape. So here's when you need to go out there and be a community scientist. The City Nature Challenge is happening Friday, April 30th through Monday, May 3rd. And basically, if you use iNaturalist, at any time during that weekend, it could be uh, midnight on Saturday or really early in the morning on Monday. As long as it's within that time frame and you're standing in one of those counties, it automatically counts towards the City Nature Challenge. Here are just some kind of the nitty gritty details for how to participate. So we've gone over when you need to collect your observations between Friday, April 30th and Monday, May 3rd. Each observation you, can, you include has to have a photo or audio recording now and the precise location. And the idea with this is that you can't just say that you saw a Northern Cardinal. Uh, we need to see what you saw because that makes it objective 
And that way someone else can come in and verify what you've seen and scientists can come back and review what you've seen as well. So you actually have to have proof of identity is what we would call it. And that proof of identity has to be in the form of a photo or an audio recording. It's an unbiased way to verify your, your, your observation. You have to use the iNaturalist app in order to participate in the City Nature Challenge or the website, but you have to use the iNaturalist database. And a reminder that we are working with living things, so to treat wildlife and landscapes with respect, which means try not to pick the flowers or accidentally crush bugs as you're looking at them, and to just uh, overall be a good community scientist. And then this is a great thing to do with families, and we definitely encourage um, younger kids to participate in this event, but just uh, make sure everyone's aware that you have to be at least 13 years old to have an iNaturalist account. So one way that I've done this with school groups in the past is kids are really good at finding stuff, especially if you have them looking under logs or lifting up rocks. And so kids can be finders and adults can be the ones that actually hit the, the share button and log the observation. Let's talk about what you should look for. What are those plants and animals that would be a good thing to observe during the challenge? Well, pretty much anything you'd like. As long as it's a living thing, then it counts. So this includes mammals, birds, insects, salamanders, reptiles, plants, mushrooms, and even includes slime molds. So if it's a living thing, then it counts. Unfortunately, your pet rock does not count, but if it's a living thing, then it's fair game. And what's really cool about iNaturalist is you can also take photos of the telltale signs that animals leave behind when those signs are indicative of one particular species. So here are some examples of that. Tracks and scat work really good for mammals. Bird feathers, nests also work. And then there's some other kind of unique things that are out there like beaver chews. This picture of the holes in the tree is indicative of one kind of woodpecker. There's only one woodpecker in our area that makes these almost like an Excel spreadsheet line, columns and rows of holes and even lines. That's only the yellow-bellied sapsucker. So if you can find one of these signs that is indicative of just one particular species, you can take a picture of that as well. The only thing that we don't focus on so much is non-wild plants and animals. We call these captive and cultivated. And that would include the plants in a garden or the animals in a zoo, as well as domestic pets. Now, it doesn't mean you can't submit an observation with iNaturalist, but remember, this is supposed to be a way for scientists to learn more about the wild stuff that's growing in our area. So it's just not really the focus for this particular challenge. If you do make an observation of a non-wild plant or animal, there is a way to mark it in iNaturalist. It's this button right here. So when you're submitting your observation and you see where it says captive cultivated, just click on that and toggle it over to yes instead of no. And then if you want to submit a picture of Fido, then you can still do that as long as you've got that toggled to the right setting. Let's talk about where you should go to make these observations. Well, any green space works, and this could be a schoolyard or your favorite park. It could also be in downtown areas. You find sometimes the most surprising things growing through the sidewalks or clinging to the sides of buildings. And of course, you can always do this in your own backyard. One more setting to make you aware of, and that is the geo privacy setting. If you're choosing to upload your observations from your own backyard, then I would strongly suggest that you change the geo privacy to obscured, and that will protect your privacy. So if you change your setting to obscured, it's just gonna show a very general location, usually the county and the state, and not an exact address. So if you're at your place of work or your school or in your backyard, then you might wanna toggle it over to obscured instead of open. And then just a reminder to have fun, but be safe. Fortunately, since this is an outdoor activity, there's lots of ways to do this with friends and loved ones and still be socially distant. So it's a great activity. So here's how the DC area did last year in 2020. And the place that the DC area really excels in is in the number of participants. So we had over 1,500 people participate last year. 
And I believe that put us in fourth place internationally, which is super impressive. Uh, we just, with in terms of as many species and biodiversity, we just can't compete with the cities in Ecuador and South America that are in the Amazon. But in terms of participants, DC always does really well. And I'm so proud of that. So this year, though, I think we're going to do even better. And that's why we need your help. We want to find even more species this year. So let's see what we can do. All right, so that was the end of part one, which included everything you need to know about iNaturalists and the City Nature Challenge. Does anybody have any questions so far? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put them in the chat and I'll just give you 30 seconds here before I move on. Take a breather, take a breath, stretch. <laughs> Okay, again, if you think of anything, go ahead and let me know. We're moving on to part two, which is uh, kind of my favorite part of this discussion because I'm going to share with you some of my favorite tips and tricks for finding cool creatures in your own backyard. Oh, I've got one question here. The question about the app, I'm looking at the map and I see markers in different colors, red, blue, and green. Oh, yeah, what's the difference? Good, good question. Thank you so much, Sharon, for asking that. So I'm curious if anyone thinks they might know the answer to that. Okay, in some circles, yep. Okay, so the different color coding when you look at the map and the explore setting, uh, that's to indicate different types of taxa. So um, the plants I believe are green, anything that's an invertebrate, which includes insects and worms and anything that doesn't have a spine is gonna have its own color. And then I think, uh, fungi have their own color as well. I'm just going on memory here. Uh, basically, the answer is that that's going to be different types of, of living creatures. They're going to be color coded that way. Hope that answers your question. Okay, great. And keep questions coming as we go through. Again, this is a very casual presentation, so interrupt at any time. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about what community science is. So you may have heard the word citizen science before, and that is exactly the same thing. I'm choosing to use the word community science here because I think it's more inclusive, but I also think it's a better term to describe what community science is, which is a community effort. It's an exchange between the general public and the scientific community. And it's also got uh, other stakeholders involved, organizations like the organization I work for, Montgomery Parks, we help and also benefit from these community science projects. So it really is that community effort of people and scientists and organizations coming together. Okay, we got a couple more questions coming in. So can I do this challenge in Falls Church? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Maryland, so I'm not as familiar with my Virginia geography, um, but we'll, Let's make sure we answer that before the end of the presentation. I'll look it up for you. Um, okay, the other question I have is, does the app tell you if you've found an invasive species and what should you do if it does? Ooh, really good questions, guys. Um, oh, and Dee, thank you for answering that first question. Yes, Falls Church is in Fairfax County. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm not so familiar with Northern Virginia. I'm sorry about that. Okay, let me go back to Leslie's question. She asked, does the app tell you if you found an invasive species and what you should do if it does? Um, yes. So the best way to see if something's invasive or endangered is to view your observations on the web. So when you create your free iNaturalist account, it'll give you access to the app, but it'll also give you access to the website. So what I like to do, if you want a more detailed synopsis of your observation and more information about the animal that you found, is to go to the website, log in on the website, and then instead of the sort of simplified version that you'll see in your app, we'll get a ton of more information about that plant or animal you found. And there'll be a little marker at the top near the name that will tell you if it's invasive. I believe it says I-N and it's pink and it's right next to the name, or it'll say E-N and I'm not sure what color it is, but that means endangered. So if you want more information than you've ever needed about that plant or animal, go on the website and look at your observation there. And it'll show you range maps. It'll show you um, uh, a, a kind of a synopsis from Wikipedia about how the description of the animal. So you get a lot of info there. Now, if you find an invasive species, it sort of depends on where you are, uh, what you should do about it. 
if there is um, an organization that's administering that land, if it's public land and it's say in Montgomery Parks, for example, or in Northern Virginia, a, a county park, then you might wanna let them know. You might wanna let staff know if there's a way to do that. I don't recommend pulling out invasive weeds without getting a little more information first because um, some weeds you can pull out and that's great, but other weeds, you, you pull them out, you actually can make the problem worse. So um, before you pull anything out, it's good to just have a little bit of training and, and weed removal. So your role here, if you know nothing about invasive plants is really in the finding, identifying and notifying aspect. So great questions, everybody. So the community scientist helps with a study's most important aspect, which is data. And often scientific studies are limited by the amount of data that they can collect. So when we crowdsource the collecting of data, then scientists can ask bigger questions and more nuanced questions and deeper questions. So basically we help with crowdsourcing data collection, let scientists ask a little bit more than they otherwise would. So we talked a little bit already about this idea of proof of identity, and this is what makes this real science. So this is not just uh, an exercise and something that's just fun. This is actually real science. And part of the way it becomes real science is that proof of identity. So when you include the photo or the audio recording, that's an unbiased example that another person can come and verify. So that's why you need to include that photo or that audio recording. Now, whether you're taking a photo or an audio recording, every time I make an observation, I ask myself this question. What distinguishes this organism from any other? And how do I capture those unique characteristics in my observation? So let me give you an example of this. I was hiking up in the Frederick watershed and I found this frog and I'm like, cool, what is this? I'm gonna use iNaturalist. So I brought up iNaturalist and iNaturalist gave me two options. It said it could either be this um, paper roll frog, which you have pictured here at the top left, or it could be this Southern leopard frog. And I said, hmm, because these kind of look a little bit similar and I'm not sure which one it is. The color kind of looks more like the leopard frog, but then the splotches are kind of more the shape of the pearl frog. I have no idea. Well, I did a little more research and I learned that one way that you can distinguish a pickerel frog from a southern leopard frog is to look at the frog's thighs. So the pickerel frog has yellow thighs on the inside of the legs. The southern leopard frog does not. So that is this, this animal's distinguishing characteristic that makes it unique especially when it's compared to similar looking species. So what I did is when I put it in iNaturalist, I made sure to take a picture of those yellow thighs. And that way it was really easy for someone else to come along and verify what I found. They didn't have to try to zoom in on the photo and, and try to pick between pickerel and southern leopard frog. They could see the yellow, they saw immediately that it was a pickerel frog. So you can see my observation. This is what iNaturalist looks like on the web, by the way, when you're looking at your observation. It became research grade. So you have, um, your observations can become scientific research when another iNaturalist user comes along and confirms your identification. So this is the cool thing about iNaturalist is that it's sort of a two-part system. It uses artificial intelligence to help you make us uh, an identification. But then it also uses real people to come along and verify what you found. So it's not just the computer telling you what's here. There are real people using iNaturalist that come along and confirm identification. So you can see under my name here, I suggested it was a pickerel frog. And then below that, another person came along and confirmed that. And as soon as there's two people that confirm it, then it becomes research grade and it's available to scientists then. So you can see the uh, observation looks a little bit different on the web. You get a little more information than what you see in the app. Okay. Now, you might be feeling a little bit intimidated because you didn't know that a pickerel frog had yellow thighs, right? Who knows that? That's not common knowledge. How are you supposed to take good photos if you don't know things like that? Well, don't worry, okay? So I have this cheat sheet here. And what I will do is I can forward this on. Um, 
Do you think we're going to be able to send this to people? I'm not sure if you're still. Sure, we can. Oh, okay, good, great. Okay, so I have this cheat sheet, and I'll send it to um, send it to you guys. And basically, what this cheat sheet tells you is what to take a picture of for each type of plant or animal, so that you can capture those types of characteristics. And then you don't have to know silly things like pickerel frogs have yellow thighs. You'll just know to take a picture of the whole frog, and that'll cover it. Okay, another good tip is to use all of your photos. So our naturalist lets you submit four photos with each observation. Use as many as you need to to capture those unique characteristics. So I have this picture of a tree and you can see the photo all the way over on the right is a picture of the whole tree. And that's kind of good for seeing like the general shape of the tree and everything, but it doesn't really give you a good close up of the leaves. So I included two extra photos, one of the leaves and then one of the flower. And now with these three photos paired together, an expert would be able to come along and immediately figure out what this is. So use all your photos, take pictures of all parts of the organism, and then hopefully you're capturing all those unique characteristics. Okay, I've got some tips for you for taking good scientific photos with a cell phone. So, which one of these is better for scientific observation? I've got a picture on the left here that was taken by a professional photographer. It's very lovely. And then the picture over here on the right is one I took with my cell phone. And it's, uh, well, it's not the best picture that has been taken of a field sparrow. I did my best, but I was just using a cell phone. So anyone want to venture which one might be better for iNaturalist? Dee says the one on the right. Thank you, Dee. I appreciate that you like my photo. You know, I would kind of agree with you, even though I'm biased. And um, that's because these are both field sparrows, by the way, the same type of bird. But I would argue that the one on the right, the one that I took with my cell phone, is actually a, a better, better able to show you some of the things that distinguish it as a field sparrow. So you can just faintly see that white eye ring around the eye. You can see the pink bill, the unstreaked buffy breast, and the double wing bar. So these are the things that make this a field sparrow and not some other kind of sparrow. And the one on the left that the professional photographer took, that one has that flower kind of obscuring some of those things. So it may not actually be as good of a scientific photo. So the only point that I'm trying to make here is that pictures that you take for artistic purposes are a little different than the pictures you take for scientific purposes. So I would argue you should hang that one on the wall on the left from the professional photographer, but then the one on the right is the one you should submit to iNaturalist. Even though it's blurry, it's not as pretty, it actually is a better scientific photo. I hope that just means that you'll feel like you don't have to be a great photographer in order to do community scientists because I am not a great photographer. So here's what I take with me into the field. I try to travel light. I don't try to take any heavy equipment with me. All I have is my cell phone. I take my binoculars and a magnifying lens. And I'll show you why in just a moment. Sometimes I bring a flashlight and a, or a pocket mirror. And then I sometimes bring a tape measure as well. And let me show you why. Okay. So to be a good cell phone photographer for scientific purposes, there's a couple of little things you can do to take much better pictures. The first one is to get close to your subject. So here are some Virginia bluebells. And the one on the left, I just took by standing there and just kind of holding my phone out and snapping it. And then the one on the right, I actually got down a little bit lower and I got a little closer to those bluebells so that they filled the frame and looked really big. So do the one on the right, make it really big, make it fill your frame when you're taking a picture much easier to see the flowers and the leaves. Okay, so not everything can, um, we can't get close to everything, right? So birds, for example, really hard to get close to. Let me show you a cool trick you can do um, with just a pair of binoculars. So here on the left, oh, I hope it will work. Oh no. Oh my goodness, this video was working earlier. Darn, okay, well, you can take a pair of binoculars and you can actually line up the, um, your, your phones, your cell phone's camera. You can actually hold that up to the lens of your binoculars and it's called digiscoping. And I wish I could show you this uh, video, it was working earlier. 
but basically it'll bring that uh, bird or mammal much closer and you can snap photos through your cell phone using those binoculars like an impromptu zoom lens. So that's one great tip you can use. For things that are really small, you can take pictures right through your magnifying lens. So here you can see these little tiny field chickweed flowers. They're itty bitty. And it's a little hard to see the detail on them, but you can hold that magnifying lens up and then take a picture right through the magnifying lens. And as you can see, they're much bigger and easier to see now. So those are two tricks you can use for proximity to make something far away appear closer or something small appear bigger. Okay, focus, really important because if you're not in focus, then you can't sometimes see those important distinguishing details. And the biggest tip here is just to check your photos before you walk away. So it's really upsetting when you find something cool and you snap a whole bunch of photos and then you leave and then you get home that night and realize none of them were in focus. So I always recommend to check photos on the spot before you walk away make sure you got at least one good one. And that way uh, you won't be sad later. <laughs> Okay, lighting. So um, this applies if you're taking pictures at night, but sometimes also during the day if you're in a really shady part under the trees. That's why I bring this flashlight sometimes, or the other thing you can use is a pocket mirror. You just take that pocket mirror out and you use it to kind of bounce a little extra light on your subject. And that can kind of illuminate things and give them a little bit better color and detail as well. And my final tip for cell phone photography is don't forget about perspective and scale. So the mushroom is just to remind you to take pictures of all from all different angles. And especially with mushrooms, um, the parts that you use to identify what the mushroom is, is usually the underside of the cap. So a lot of times people take a picture from the top looking down on the mushroom and you see the top of the cap. But any person who knows their fungi is gonna say, Hmm, I wonder what's underneath that cap. Is it gills or pores or teeth? Because mushrooms have a lot going on underneath that cap. So make sure you get underneath the cap as well. The picture of the tree is to show you that you can use your hand for scale. And pretty much every single time I take a picture of a plant, my hand is in the picture all the time. It's not a mistake, it's, on, it's intentional. And uh, that's another one of those ways that art pictures are different than scientific pictures. I put my hand in there to give you to show you how big that leaf is compared to my hand. You can also do that with that tape measure that I mentioned earlier. So here's a picture of a canine track in the mud. And sometimes the difference between figuring out whether it's a coyote or a fox is size. And that's all we have to know to be able to make that distinction. So having a tape measure next to it really helps show what size that track is. Someone that's an expert can come along and figure out, is that a coyote or is that a fox? Okay, and just a reminder to review and edit. And this is why I like to take pictures just using my phone's regular camera app first. That gives me a chance to kind of scroll through, find the best ones. I don't do a lot of editing in terms of changing the color or the brightness, but I do crop things to make them big and to fill the frame. Because a lot of people who are using iNaturalist and reviewing your observations, the scientists or other iNaturalist users, they're also on their cell phone. And so they're looking at a little tiny screen if you can make that subject big and fill the frame, then it helps them out too. So uh, after I go through all my photos, review, edit, find the best ones, that's when I open the iNaturalist app and then upload directly from my camera roll. The other advantage to doing that is that I can do that from home when I'm connected to Wi-Fi and a power source so I don't run out of battery and I don't run out of data. Okay, audio recordings, brand new this year. For the first time in the app, you can use audio recordings. And you kind of approach audio recordings much the same way that you would do photos. So you can, um, the best thing to do is make your subject obvious. So if you're trying to tape a bird calling, then try not to have lots of birds calling because then it's hard to figure out which one you're trying to use in your observation. Try to minimize background noise, which includes talking or cars or airplanes, because having that interference can help make it harder to hear the the pitch and the tonal quality of something and then trim to the shortest length so sometimes uh you hit the record button and you're waiting a really long time before that bird calls again so don't make the person who's reviewing your observation wait for two minutes trim that audio recording to the shortest length so that it plays as soon as they open it
Okay, so we're moving on to the last part of this presentation, which is those cool tips and tricks to finding neat plants and animals in your own backyard. So I hope, hope you guys will find these things fun. Okay, we're gonna go over a couple of my favorite, what I'm calling wildlife traps. Now that sort of sounds like a scary thing. It's not a scary thing. A trap is really just anything that will passively collect information about an animal. And sometimes this is actually a less invasive way to get information about animals because it sort of removes you from the picture. And so that animal doesn't feel threatened or scared. So let's talk about what that means with some examples. Here's some examples of wildlife traps that can include things like game cameras, um, which again would collect pictures of animals, they're motion activated, would collect pictures of animals without you even being there. So sometimes a less invasive way to get observations of animals. But I'm gonna show you some that are uh, no materials or money investment required. There's things that you can set up right in your own backyard with just using some common household supplies. This is my favorite wildlife trap ever, okay? This is called a snake board. And all you need to do is take an old piece of plywood or cardboard put them out now, give them at least a week to start collecting things. And the idea is that shy, secretive creatures that maybe aren't out and about during the day will seek refuge under these snake boards. So put them out in the woods or in a field, come and check them at, at, after a week, leave them out all summer and they'll bring you joy uh, all summer long. I put these out and then visited them with school groups before, and we found all kinds of cool things under here. Uh, we lifted one up one time and found a field, a mother field mouse nursing some baby field mice. We find salamanders, toads, lots of insects. And if you're really lucky, you'll get a snake, which is always what I'm hoping to see when I lift one of these up. And typically the snakes that use these are the small snakes, the small non-venomous snakes favor these. Things like garter snakes, ring-necked snakes, decays brown snakes, snakes that only get to be maybe eight inches long at, at their full mature length or only a foot long at their full mature length. So these are tiny little snakes that you otherwise would just never see because they're so shy and secretive and they live underneath logs and leaves or under the ground. So you just don't see them. That's my favorite wildlife trap. Here's another one you can set up right in your own backyard. This is a mopping station. All you need is a white sheet and a bright light. So you hang that white sheet up in between two trees or just toss it over a fence and then shine a bright flashlight on it. You can also use a UV light, which brings in different species. Do this at night, on a night when it's not windy or rainy, it's clear and it's warm, and all kinds of moths will come in and use your mothing station. They'll land on the sheet. You can snap some photos, submit them to my naturalist, or even just see what you get and just enjoy the, the show from all these different moths coming in. One way to sweeten the deal is to add some bait. So a good moth bait is um, beer, and old browned bananas and sugar. So I take a, an old blackened banana, pour some beer over it and some sugar and I put it all in a mason jar and I just shake it up and then I leave it on my counter for a few days. And then I take that bait and I can paint um, the trees with it or I can leave it out in a little shallow dish. And some things that aren't necessarily attracted to the light might come in because they're attracted to that sweet smell of fermentation and they'll come in and investigate. So this is another wildlife trap for collecting moths. Uh, one thing about this trap is it does disrupt the activities of the moths. They're flying around and then they kind of get uh, pulled into your little trap. So I do recommend turning it off. So maybe spend a half hour with the lights on and everything and then turn everything off for 15 minutes. That'll give everything a chance to leave and go about its regular business and not be too disrupted by this activity. All right, and finally, we're gonna talk about a couple of, of collection equipment items that might make your job a little easier. We've already talked a little bit about my favorite tools to take into the field, like the mirror and the little tape measure. Here are some other ones you might find helpful. Now, the one that I wanna bring to your attention is this specimen jar that this girl has. A specimen jar is a great way to get a good photo of something that you don't want to touch or that doesn't want to be touched by you. 
So um, if for a fish, for example, it would be a little awkward to scoop that fish out of the water and have it on your palm while you're trying to take pictures. Um, the stinging insect, probably not something you want to have on the palm of your hand to take pictures, like a wasp or a bee. Um, things like salamanders and amphibians are, they have very sensitive skin. It dries out really easily. If you have any products on your skin, like sunscreen or bug spray, that can be absorbed by an amphibian like a frog or a salamander and be harmful to them. So for creatures like that, these specimen jars are great. You can put the creature in the jar and then nobody has to worry about touching anything. And what's great about the ones with the clear tops is you can take your picture right through the top of the jar. So they work really great for that. All right, and that's all the tips I have for you for the City Nature Challenge and um, tips in general for being a good community scientist. The thing I wanna stress is that you don't need to know the names of the plants and animals in order to participate. That's what the iNaturalist community is, is there for you. So the app will help you make those identifications. And then even if you don't know using the app, then the iNaturalist community will come and help make identifications for you as well. So if you took a picture of those uh, that wild columbine flower and just listed it as plant and nothing else, uh, within a, a couple of hours, someone would be along to make a suggestion for you and help you figure out what it is. So I don't think there's any reason that anyone shouldn't participate in the City Nature Challenge. This is a community science project that's really open to anyone, any age and ability, and I highly encourage you to participate. So thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I will still take questions. If you have questions, happy to answer them. All right, so I'm just curious if anyone's planning to participate in the City Nature Challenge. And if you are, if you have any new ideas for where you wanna go or what you wanna do, feel free to share. I guess I'll just unmute myself and say first, that was really fascinating. And uh, I think when we're out outdoors, really, you can do it anywhere, you know. And so maybe on my hikes or, you know, just going to a park and just pull out my camera and now be on the lookout for this. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, great. Yeah, so you can add this to your regular hiking routine. If you're someone that likes to visit a park on occasion and take a walk, now's the time of year when those first wildflowers are just starting to bloom. Take the app out and see if you can figure out what those flowers are. Um, that's a great way to, to try using it without doing anything different or special. You can just use it in your normal walk in the park. All right. Well, we have uh, one weekend coming up before the City Nature Challenge. So this coming weekend, if you're planning to participate in the City Nature Challenge, I would recommend going out this weekend to give it a try and um, figure out the different features and Try using that artificial intelligence and see how that works for you. Um, that way you'll be ready to go for the following weekend, which is the actual City Nature Challenge. Hope you all will participate. We love having new people participate and it really does contribute to a great scientific um, uh, research interest. So we thank you for doing that. And you know, Earth Day, um, one of the things that I love about using uh, a community science project like this is that it, it forces you to stop and see things that maybe you wouldn't see before. So if you're looking down at the ground, the things that we'd normally step over, like flowers, like salamanders, you're going to notice them a lot more when you're working on a bio blitz challenge like the City Nature Challenge. So that's why I love it for Earth Day. Um, go out there this Earth Day and see what things you notice that you maybe wouldn't notice before because you're using the app, so. All right, I see some people have some plans to participate and some plans to share with others. So that's awesome, that, that makes me happy. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Okay, well, that's all I have for you guys. And I wanna thank you again for coming and um, I will send that cheat sheet out so that you have that info. So I think, I think that's it.